Yeah, direct misfire, talking many war games. Ben some and Spoon are taking aim. Comment, like, and subscribe today, keeping you notified and up to date. Hello, champs, and welcome once again to another direct misfire missive. Joining me today, as always, is Spoon and Selic as we cover the Clash of Kings organized play supplement book. Hello guys, how you going? Good, good. How you going? Yeah, good mate. Oh yeah, alright. Doing fine. Having a bit of a read of this however many page book it is. 47 page book. It is 47. And finding it interesting and a very easy read. Thoughts? <laughs> well, my thoughts originally is uh, I think the first half of the book's going to be quite helpful for the first tournament, but there's really four pages there that uh, I'm going to keep rereading over and over. Yes, so what the book is made up of, is, um, it starts off with a tournament guide, so really it's aimed at those who haven't run a tournament before. It steps you through all the um, checkpoints as to how to uh, find a location, format, timing the tournament as well, and scoring and whatnot. Then it moves on to the league guide, so how to run a league, uh, slow grow ladder, um, it's got examples for an experience system as well, and an achievement system, which I thought was a bit unusual. Yeah, that's a bit odd, isn't it? <laughs> Very naughty, um, which isn't is it? a checklist of, uh, I don't know, it's kind of like achievements in um, video games, all these boxes. First one is cause 30 or more damage to a single unit than roll level ones for the nerve test, so if you happen to have that in your game, you can tick it off and then... You don't get any satisfying jingle or reward for that. It's just a <laughs> tick in your book, <laughs> which is a bit sad. But I'm probably going to run through these anyway, and we'll see if I can smash them out by the end of the year. No doubt. Yes. Um, so after the achievement system, using terrain and tournaments as only a two-page spread, then writing your own rules if you wanted to uh, mix things up, like in the recent International Campaign Day, how we could create our own character and there were some guides as to how to do that. Similar thing here. But what most competitive players and probably a whole bunch of you who listen to us want to know about is the rules. So the Clash of Kings rule changes, artifacts, spells, and scenario changes. So let's get into the meat and taters of that. Selic, so, like, how about you run off the changes first of uh, what this book brings to uh, the game as a whole? Yeah, sure. Army composition, specials and whatnot. Not a problem. So we'll start off for everyone reading along at home on page 39. Um, so the major changes here, we'll start off with army composition. So this really formalised a couple of rules that have been around the trap. So that's uh, from 0 to 1,499 points, you'd just get one max duplicates so that means you can only take one of each of the uh, unit types so that just ripples through to one to two to three depending upon how many points you're playing so that's hero must monsters and war machines yeah. yes that can't that's, be that's correct yeah. um, so it's just making sure that people can't just pick the powerful choice um, and then just duplicate it up uh, taking Super five spam. or six times uh, which is pretty handy. Mm -hmm. uh, the next sort of things we've got through is the special rule changes um, these have been spoken a fair bit around uh, on forums and whatnot, particularly Facebook at the moment, uh, with thousand threaded uh, conversations. But <laughs> yeah. the, uh, the important ones here is the breath attack, fireball, and lightning bolt. That's going to be affected by cover now. So that means that if you are shooting at something that is in cover with your uh, breath attack, fireball, or your lightning bolt, you're hitting on fives instead of fours. This is going to severely impact a lot of armies obviously a lot of army builds that are heavily reliant on the lightning bolt at the end of the day we're looking at what is it 16.7 percent if your math hammer worked um <laughs> if. but at the end of the day it's not that big it just means that your army can't be based around it because you're losing a large percentage if you want to look at it as an army base yeah um so i think and it doesn't it. affect stealth or um individual either no after yeah. much debate along the just forums cover i think that was a final change that they removed that right oh, i can't remember i don't know uh the next one there is a uh, fly being when you're disordered you lose your fly and your nimble if if you were reliant on your nimble with your fly um mm -hmm. so that one has always been played as long as i've played kings of war in our tournament scene um so yeah just make sure that you just dis uh, disorder your flyer and then you won't be able to let them fly over the top and Probably the biggest change, if we can get a drum roll here. Uh. <laughs> Thanks, mate. 
<laughs> and that that is just the bane chance. So there was a fair bit of reliance on accurate shooting. So we'll say four plus or even large volumes of five plus being impacted by bane chant getting the extra piercing and all of a sudden it becomes uh, overpowered so the change here is that bane chant now needs two hits from the bane chant to be piercing on uh, ranged units mm. and considering most casters have bane chant too uh, it's quite a bit harder mm, definitely so I'm not sure if you guys could list off the top of your head, but I could only think of one, and that's in the undead list. That's um, a faceless guy. So uh, the herd have bane chant three. Bane chant three. So even that's relatively low percentage as well. Hmm. But they don't have a, um, a large amount of decent shooting, so that's that's not really the issue. Yeah, true. So I think uh, Morgoth, the faceless, he's got bane chant four. Uh, the mm-hmm. warlock from the rat king has. Bane Chant 3, or you can upgrade to have Bane yep. Chant 3. So um, mm-hmm. those are the guys that you could start basing it around, purely around that you are now going to have the advantage, where previously Bane Chant 4 was almost a waste, uh, in my opinion. Yeah. Like, it was just more security over something that you were pretty good on odds, anyway. Mm. And it just makes the yeah, Elf Horde archers harder to Bane Chant, that's all. Well, mm. I, I just don't think you'll ever do it now. Being... Mm. Uh, up-and-comer elf player i look at that combination and the the frequency that it's going to happen and you just you wouldn't pick a mage to be a, a bane chanter i don't think for mm. the archers you just take piercing on them yep. yeah all right what else we got so this is changes to units so undead the cursed pharaoh has gone from defense six back to five the vampire lord has done exactly the same thing so he's gone from defense six back to five so i'll pause there <laughs> And here, how many times have you faced vampire lords just by themselves, blocking up a whole yeah. side of a board? <laughs> yeah, I try not to play those people. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's going to be a big change to a lot of people's army lists, I think. Yep. Um, so I might just uh, throw over to Spoon there for uh, his Empire of Dust unit that's changed. Uh, so the, the Empire of Dust Pharaoh, uh, same as the Cursed Pharaoh for the Undead, gone down to Defence 5. And the fiends and the night stalkers, their nerve has been reduced. The regiments are now twelve slash fifteen, and the hordes are fifteen slash eighteen, which is much needed. Yeah, because they were very very hard to kill. Uh, they they were what was it? The horde seventeen. I think they were 20. seventeen twenty. Yeah. Yeah. I can have a look now. Keep going. So it's a drop by two. <laughs> yeah. And the was it mind screech? Yep. Um, that's also had its nerve drop to fourteen seventeen from sixteen nineteen. Yep. So both have dropped two, yep. which is quite substantial. Uh, move on to the next one. Yeah, one. Well, mm-hmm. Herge of the Fallen, oh, of the Fallen rather, for the Varangur. Replace judgment rules with this is a ranged attack that can be used once per game. Follows the same rules as Heal 5 that can be used on any friendly non-allied unit on the board regardless of range or line of sight. So just pick a unit in play and then Heal 5 yep. Yep. once. Yeah, just once per game. Uh, it's a bit of a drop. <laughs> mm. Yeah. As opposed to the um, 50% chance of just keeping a unit that should be off the board on. Yep. Just so that everyone at home knows, these are not point reductions either. These are just stat changes. Points remain mm-hmm. exactly the same. So these are, are nerfs, as you would call it in a computer game, not affecting the point cost. No, that's right. Over to you with the death engine. Okay, so the last bunch of changes we've got, the next one is from the Ratkin faction. The death engine, so if you're going to take the vile sorcery upgrade, your defense is going to drop to 4+. plus. I think that's fine. Yep. Yep. And now we get a couple of buffs for a few of the underperforming armies. So the salamanders get vicious on the Kaisenor lances, fire drake, clan lord and clan lord on fire drake. <laughs> Massive. The lances are now a decent combat unit instead of just things that you kind of don't want to take but you really don't have much cover in that army mm. anyway, so you take them. They'll, they'll still disappear in a stiff breeze, but <laughs> at least they can punch a bit harder. The Trident Realm, they have Ensnare on the Placoderms, Placoderm Defender, Riverguard, Riverguard, Captain, and Nokken. One unit in particular with this change is going to make it pretty dang good. <laughs> uh, the <laughs> Placoderms, if I'm not mistaken, which are Defense 6, yeah, I think now so. have Ensnare. Phalanx and Ensnare. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy, something that it? you don't want to be taking front of. No. Nah. But it is an expensive unit for a horde, so you're kind of investing in it. And last, we have the orcs, who have fury on a bunch of units, uh, which makes sense thematically. Fight wagons, Morax, Crudger, Crudger on Slasher, Crudger on Gore, Chariot, and Gakamak. Gakamak. <laughs> fine. <laughs> what or fine. A guy. 
And that is all of the rule and unit changes. So just on the last three there, those are huge changes. That's like over five units in each of these armies that are benefiting from a, a sweeping rule. Do you reckon that's going to mm. see a little bit more frequency, particularly around salamanders and orcs? So tridents will obviously come when the models come a little bit later. Well, I'd like to take my salamanders again now and see how they go. Because <laughs> they, they were just lacking yep. in something. Yeah, The fire drake with uh, vicious as a standard rule is going to be pretty good, isn't it? Like breath 15 or something? Yeah. Is that breath 16, yeah. So that's pretty, that's pretty nifty. Mm. Mm. Yes, I'll have to get my model out for that one, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, good changes, I reckon, for the better. Yep. They need it. Yeah, totally agree with that. Next section, artifacts and spells. So what has happened here, Selig? Well, the major changes is what we would deem as the um, auto-includes of the artifact world. So the enscrolled armor, the brew of Keninus. Uh, which is the uh, plus one hit for the uh, ranged units and the medallion of life, the regen. They've all been removed but replaced with 10 new artifacts and uh, three new spells. Mm. Mm. Kind of glad the, that the brew of Keninus is gone, not just because it was a annoying rule on shooters, but because I think the name is a bit weird. Brew of Keninus. Yeah, I didn't like it. It doesn't roll off the tongue very <laughs> well. Um, okay, how about we start off by going through the artifacts? All right, sounds good. First up, what have we got? So first up, we've got uh, Healing Brew for five points. So this one here is a one per game uh, item, and it heals D3 points of damage previously suffered. So only five points. It's uh, pretty good with your spare points, I think. Taking down a couple of notes here, uh, just with, I reckon, a tree man, if you've got five points left over, or a tree herder. Your flying lord, once again, if you've got five points left over, and probably any sort of six-plus defense unit uh that's once again got the five points left over it'll be pretty handy and yeah healing brew is a new war bow <laughs> yep something that's actually going to be used and not forgotten about uh all my golems that used to take the war bow now have a healing brew <laughs> instead mm. yeah like you said defense six nice little treat yeah i think it's just going to like once you've grind down a defense six you can and you get out of that combat all of a sudden you can just pop back d3 wounds and continue on your merry way um, I see hmm. it on the, uh, some of the Defense 6 cav. It's going to be pretty big if you couldn't afford the points, obviously. Defense 6 cav, you yes. usually would yeah. spend the points, but um, I think if, if you were ever in that situation, it'll be good. Uh, the next item there is the Spark Stone for 10 points. Uh, so this one here is a bit of a weird item for, for mine. Um, I'm still struggling to see where I want to use it, but uh, effectively it's a ranged attack uh, with 18 inches. You can only target heroes, monsters, and war engines, and you roll one dice, one d6, and you need a four up, and when you get the four up, it's disordered for the next turn. So you can effectively stop a war engine from shooting, a monster from maybe flying around, or a hero from uh, casting as well. But yeah, it's... I it's like a, it. it. It's good. But once again, I think it's very situational. You're going to have to... I don't know. I, I'm not sold on it just yet. Personally. For me, I would pop it on any fast hero, and he will try to shut down flying monsters. I don't know. What do you reckon? I don't know. I like the idea of it. It'd be a pain in the ass against my Abyss army, because I've got a couple of flyers that I want to get into combat, and I could see them shutting them down quickly if they roll up that 4+, plus, like my Temptress and the likes. Mm -hmm. um, from using it in my army at the moment, I'm struggling to see where I'd put it. It'd have to be on um, fleshlings or something. I mean, 18-inch range covers half the board, and just trying to throw a rock at a mage to cast yeah, important spells is yeah. pretty I good. think it's handy. The, the issue I have with it is it's 10 points across, we'll say, six and a half rounds for a 50% chance. It's only a single dice. I would almost mm -hmm. pay 15 points if it was 2d6, but it's just... I don't know, it's only ever going to come off like in three of your round or three of your uh, effective rounds. And I'm just not sure that I would want to be setting a, a unit up there or a, a hero up for a 50-50 to shut something down. I, I just don't think that 10 points warrants it in any of my armies at least for a, a maybe. You couldn't base any play around it. Depending on the army that I take... Um... I'd probably be including this in almost all of my lifts. I know you say 50-50, but for me, uh, math armor just, <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> and I could be getting this thing off every turn for the yeah. entire game. Shut when, me down. If, when I have my goblin army up and going and my ratkin, it'll be a, a must-take. 
for 10 points. Mm. Um, yeah, so cheap. just in an elite... For potentially something quite um, yeah, powerful. I just struggle to put it in my elite Abyss Army, I reckon, at this point in time. Yeah. yeah I, uh, once again, I think it is very situational. Um, it'll be something very, very good for a cheap unit mm. to take. Yeah, it has to be I'm cheap. just looking at it from a, an Elven Mage or any of the undead characters. You sort of have a look at it and go, well, for 10 points, I could also take Fireball 10. So Yeah, and you've got to sacrifice mm. your shooting attack. To All shooting it. for it. So yeah. for, once again, Math Hammer doesn't work, but it's still a, a 4+. plus. So mm. that, that, to me, that's where I'm sitting on the fence. I'm not sold until it ruins me in a tournament. <laughs> later on this year <laughs> then it's and then it's broken that's it then it's broken and i'll auto include it um <laughs> the next one that we would move on to is the helm of the ram <laughs> um so this one here just gives one unit thunderous charge one or increases it by one i love this item it's like crushing strength it's just not mm. as good but it isn't as which good, is why it's cheaper but um i just really love it i'm having a look at the moment flying heroes once again it's only 15 points uh in some sort of uh, fast flanking unit like werewolves or any sort of unit that you've got a spare 15 points that's got a lot of attacks that's like a glass yeah. cannon yeah. yeah if you can't afford the crushing strength you can <laughs> the take next this. best thing <laughs> or you've already taken it yeah yeah not much to say about that i reckon pretty straightforward so the next one is uh, blood of the old king for 15 points one once per game uh the unit gains elite and vicious for one turn uh, at, but this must be declared before the unit rolls any attacks. Yeah. Nifty, nifty little I'm item. Very curious around your top one unit for taking this. So it's it's definitely only one use only. So it's not too overpowered, but it is only fifteen points. I would put them on ogre boomers. They're the mm. breath weapon ones, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's right. They start naturally with piercing one. Yes, that's it. I think that's the only downside about this item for mine is that uh, there's two units or two armies particularly um, and it, it's growing now with the changes that we've mentioned earlier that sort of get nullified by one of these effects. Um, mm. So, But mm. it definitely does help. I had Berserker Braves uh, for the Ogres. Lots of attacks um, that could benefit from a one-off. They will just wipe out a unit if they get lucky. Mm. Or, at, or anything of that ilk, like Kingdoms of Men, Militia Mob, imagine having a, a legion of 60 with the Blood of the Old King. That's a total of 185 points for hitting on fives but re-rolling ones, 30 yep. attacks, and then re-rolling ones to, one to, hit, yeah. to damage. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, pretty good for a I was thinking front. Succubi at one, 190 points yeah. for a regiment. Again, lots of attacks. Hmm. Plus a 15, that's not too bad. I know they've got no crushing or thunder mm. or anything like that, but it's still 25 attacks hitting on threes, re-roll ones. And more chances to, re yeah. to roll more dice. Yeah, yeah, the other one I had on my list of three here is uh, Stampede from the Herd. So they've got a lot of... Uh, they've got crushing one from memory and uh, thunderous three. So that means that they'll increase their hits and almost guarantee their wounds, and they'll just wipe out any unit. But once again, you've just got to invest 15 points and not take something that's going to be around for all the other turns. Mm. Yes. Um, the yep. other one there is the, I think, an Efreet. What's that, Breath 15 on those guys? Yeah, uh, 20. Breath, Breath 20. 20, there you go. So I think one of those guys would be pretty good as well, um, just yeah. increasing the mm -hmm. hits and the wounds. Yep. yep. Next one, we've got Banner of the Griffin for 20 points. The unit, uh, this unit, sorry, gains the Rallying 1 special rule. So this just adds one to the nerve and route value to units within six inches of said unit. Any banner bearer, which is usually the cheap guy, the standard bearer, yeah. I'll be popping this on him so he's inspiring and making everyone else more higher nerve for 70 points, 60 to 70 points, yep. depending on your army. That's really good. That's pretty good. <laughs> so good for 20 points. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he doesn't do anything else, but I don't care. He's sitting behind my army waving his flag and making everyone... Yeah not run is pretty cool my um abyss army standard or battle standard bearer whatever you want to call it he's dropping his healing charm for um for that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it's almost too good that for 20 points it's but this is there's a couple in here that uh i disagree with the point costs but that's if you if you keep your army yeah you've got to keep yep. it all squished up there's only six inch bubble if you want to really get some value out of it, then you've got to squish it up. Because usually you've got a couple of inspiring sources, so it's only one of them that's getting Yeah, it. my sort of, my brain, um, sorry for everyone at home once again, uh, really thinks about this as if you can separate your army, so you keep all your inspiring and your heavy hitting units over one side and then your throwaway units 
over on the other side but just with the rallying one you can just keep them around to a little bit more damage than usual i think that could be really handy mm. Mm. if you're giving him the banner of griffin you're not giving him hand grenades yes exactly and then you're losing out on some very powerful offensive <laughs> damage uh is that all for that one yeah dragon shard shield for 20 points once per game when this unit carries out a halt or pivot uh, order it may choose to increase its defense by plus two to a maximum of six plus until the start of the next turn. It may choose. You can choose not to use. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? Well, it's once per game, so it's not like you have to do it. If you do a hold or pivot, then you have yeah, to true. bump it up by two. Um, I don't like this item because it requires a lot of setup. It's kind of like a, a an unusual defensive item. You can Sure, you can fang something up there, and then next turn kind of pivot and pop the defense but then they won't charge you because it's at the start so if you move up trying to set something up they can charge you mm. and then you, you don't, don't get, get to time to what about this it? scenario where you just pivot and then use your surge to push into the side and then take the counter attack and you're at defense six yeah because it's you're still halted correct if you haven't moved or you pivoted surge yeah that could work. Yeah, yeah, but again, that requires some setup because it's surge. It's not going to be all that long of a distance, um, so they have to be pretty close anyway. Yeah. And if they know that they've got the dragon shard shield, it's it's still definitely yeah. a possibility. But I was thinking of a scenario uh, the other day, which is also two of my scenarios that when we were at uh, CanCon, that a large unit of undead archers were sitting there shooting at me I charged them to stop them and then they just we started this counter charge thing happening so they were able to mm. shoot at me then surge into me every time um, obviously not that unit but other units were able to shoot at me and then they would surge charge I just think that this would be perfect for that scenario uh, where the archer units just sitting there can't do too much However, it can sit back and then do the dragon shield once per game go up to defense I think there's six that will go to six i think they're defense four yeah and now all of a sudden you're hitting them and you're not doing much and if you roll terribly and um, there's a chance that they might be even able to shoot you next turn as well so i don't know i think it's got its uh value on shamblers and archer units but if if they hit you once then you're disordered and you can't shoot yeah so i think it might actually be best putting it on a large unit of something with regen so you run in do its charge get charged back and then for your next move, just pop it, get a defense bonus, heal up a whole bunch from regen, and keep that other unit in place. Yeah, it's not really can't going move out of the way. Yeah, mm, good point. And then you'll be able to pull off a flank charge maybe the, the turn after. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a few ways. I think defending an archer unit, I think still think it's you only ever halt or pivot. You know you're going to get charged, but you just want to have that one last shot at them. And you're really, <laughs> let's be honest, you're buying time. You're trying to hold off whatever's charging you from uh, killing you while you can finish off some other unit and get back to save them nine times out of ten with that unit. Mm. And I think just for one turn, you'll pretty much nullify 26% or something of all your attacks coming in. I, I can't, Here you go with the I, maths. I, I can't turn it off. I know it doesn't work, <laughs> but I can't turn it off. Yeah, anyway, fair point. Let's move on. Um, Hammer of Measured Force. So another 20-point item. This one, pop it on a unit and it will always damage the enemy on 4 plus in melee, regardless of any modifiers, which is mostly good. Um, if you're sticking it on any sort of berserker type unit, which has a high number of usually no crushing strength attacks, then you just auto wounding on 4s is pretty good. But conversely, if you attack something that has uh, low defense, you're actually making it harder for yourself to damage them. Mm. So with the, if you're charging anything with defense 2 or 3, you're going to be hitting on fours. But there's not that many units um, that would fit under that, so I think it's mostly good. Yeah, anything that's got a large volume of attacks with no crushing strength, like an anvil, a horde, or a legion, um, I think this is gold. Mm -hmm. Yep, pretty straightforward, I think. Um, any other thoughts? Yeah. Nah. Now, the loot of insatiable darkness. So dark, this loot. Uh, artifact can only be used by heroes, um, and it gives the hero Banechan too. For uh, twenty points, so it's just it's like another spell mm. that uses up an artifact slot. It's all right. All the armies that didn't have Banjo now have access to it. Yeah, <laughs> pretty simple. <laughs> I think a lot of my armies that I play don't have Banjo, but 
I don't think I'm missing out on that. They usually got something big and beefy that can yeah. deal damage, yeah. but I'm sure some people will be happy with that. And then we have the Zephyr Crown for another 20 points. The unit has Windblast 4, or increasing the Windblast if they've got it by 4. So another spell for artifact slot there. But I don't think anyone takes Windblast. Which is I a shame. will be taking it when I finally do my Empire of Dust. Yep, so on the Enslaved Guardians. To get a super Windblast yeah, something. Windblast Enslaved 9. Guardians. It will go to 9, yeah. Yeah, for one unit. Yeah, so that, that that's pretty much... It slightly annoys someone for a little while. Yeah. I could see a, a sort of Enslaved Guardian units, or even one or two of them, sitting back there uh, buying time while you shoot at them, and then yeah. using a spell that will mention... pushing dudes later. back. <laughs> so. yeah. um, and lastly, rounding off the artifacts, is Shroud of the Saint for 25 points. Users with a heal spell bumps up their heal value by 2. So if you've got heal 3, it goes to heal 5. I think you have a couple of units that you might want to put this on, Spoon? Uh, only one, really. Charlie? Yeah, the winged unicorn. <laughs> Got a heal nine. Ooh. That's where it's at. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's no <laughs> so much It's no, uh, no green lady with elite, but eh, yeah, it's still heal nine. Yeah, I think the uh, elves will use it a little bit just to get the poor man's green lady, uh, so they'll go up to a heal five with elite. And uh, I think the other one that might benefit there is the devoted uh, from Brotherhood. I think they can get to heal six now with this item. Oh yeah, good stuff. Now that's all the artifacts. How about we move into the three new spells that are available to everyone? They've all got a fixed number of dice, and you can take them multiple times in the same army. And they're not subject to magic artifact restrictions, so it makes them one per army. You still can't give them to monsters and whatnot. So the first one there is weakness for 20 points. So this one here's got an 18 inch range rolling two dice to hit, 2d6. And if one or more are hit, then your that target unit is now subject to negative one modifier to damage. And where a natural six will hit, obviously it will still hit. So yeah. this one here is just effectively as the spell suggests, it's Reverse a weakness crushing spell. strength. It is. Yeah. Uh, and I love this. My brain just went on overdrive. You and your maths and your numbers. <laughs> uh, I, I think this spell, taken on numerous characters, because obviously that's allowed, could actually change meta, I think. So why I say this is... All of a sudden, Defense 5 armies such as uh, Ogres, I think the Warriors that they've got, yep. uh, as Slave Guardians, uh, the Stone Priests on Dwarfs will take them for all of their cores of Defense 5, and it's effectively giving them Defense 6 where you need it. And I think it's really powerful mm. for 20 points. Mm. That's my favourite of the three spells. Yeah, it's beautiful. By far. I think I'll, I mm. like the last one, but we'll get to that shortly. <laughs> right. Yes, Weakness is a very good spell. Um, so I think there's... Tons of different scenarios that that one here can be used, but we'll jump on to the next one, which is Blood Boil. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll run through the spell, but then I want Spoon to uh, talk about his most recent game with it. So it's got a 12 inch <laughs> range. Um, it's uh, when you're rolling to hit, you roll the number of dice equal to the amount of damage on the target, and that's got piercing one. So if you've taken 10 wounds on your unit of rats, you will roll 10 dice, and on a 4 plus, you will take a hit. At piercing one so uh i'll hand over to spoon just talk us through blood boil mate <laughs> what's your first hand experience with the spell <laughs> rubbish is it it's it's a bit broken depending on the army you take it in <laughs> okay now stacks i know you're listening to this episode because you told me you were going to listen to it <laughs> uh, i played against stacks's dwarf army with three organ guns big ranger unit i don't know what the horde shooting unit's called and a couple of other shooting characters so basically it was pick a unit and take it off every turn, except he took two units off in the first turn. It was very ouch. And how did the blood boil affect that? So for every point of damage I'd taken... I just would have thought that three organ guns would be taking something off anyway, regardless of the spell being used. Uh, well, he was shooting at... I think the organ guns were shooting... Oh, I don't know if it was all tortured cells or not. I don't know. He split the fire, I think. I can't remember. But if he was shooting at the succubi... And the tortured cells, and he split it. The succubi were at minus one, but I can't remember what he was targeting. Right, because it's only a twelve-inch range. I would have thought he gets in range for you to to, to blood boil. You could just uh, charge it. Yeah, I've so I got first turn. I moved up, and he had rain a ranger character. Yeah, might have been no. It was an aloha character because he had allies. Right, with blood boil, so he had flying a flying character with blood boil. So he'd shoot it up, cast a spell, and split. Mm. Mm. But he had two. I think he had two casters with Blood Boil from memory, so yeah, it was pretty ouch. Mm. 
That's a bit different having a a low hide with the spell because that you can't easily take them off. Yeah, yeah. I reckon I was done by about turn three. Oh. Mm. But I think it is a it's a pretty fun spell. I think its practicality is going to be tested via can I put enough wounds on that before it's almost dead anyway? Is there any point using blood boil, or should I just use a like a breath weapon for example? Particularly because it's 25 points on top of it. I, I think there's some armies that it's going to really work with, like gun lines, for example, uh, goblins, uh, elves, even some of the... Undead. Ogre. Undead would be great with it. I think using it so, against, like, yeah. against Undead The Empire be of Dust, because they've got Windblast, they have the ability to take this spell as well. So you get them in combat, and then the next turn you can use the spell, do some more damage, and then surge them in for combat. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. I think the way Stax was doing it, he'd do average amount of wounds so example might have been seven or eight on succubi and then using that blood boil to get closer to the nerve Mm -hmm. so it was he might have only been routing me on like a four or five rather than a seven or eight Mm -hmm. Mm. so yeah that's how he was using it so mass firepower followed by you know one little spell to take a unit out very effective against hordes of low defense units yep yeah, it's effectively the Dyson of the spell world. Uh, what's the last spell? I'm glad you asked. Uh, it's actually mm. Soul Drain for 30 points, 6 inch range, rolling 6d6 to hit. If you do hit, they take damage as normal with piercing 1. However, a unit, a non-allied unit, within 6 inches, including the caster himself, he can choose 1, can uh, remove wounds of up to the equal to that value. So... Meaning there that you can inflict three damage on a unit and then heal three wounds off your caster. So I think this one here is uh, quite interesting. However, the, the negative there, six inch range and 30 points. Very short. Um, I like the idea of this, having a uh, backup caster spurring on a unit that's in combat, dealing some damage and then healing the unit in combat. I think that's pretty cool. Yep. Yeah, so just everyone else, you can actually cast this into combat. Mm-hmm. It's specifically mentioned there, but they don't obviously have to take a nerve test on the shooting phase. But I think it, it could be handy for some of the flying lords around um, if they can take it. Try and heal yourself up a little bit while you're out and about doing the shopping. Mm. For those that don't have access to um, some sort of damage regeneration be it regen iron resolve or heal from someone else yeah definitely uh, soul drain could help a lot hmm. uh, especially if you've got elite as well elite or vicious yeah. yeah yeah but that is the three new spells for the clash of kings organized play supplement book 2017 pretty cool they just need to add more spells for next time and keep these ones to add to the already existing spells so we've got a nice little deck of spells and then then if they have enough we can then start kind of palming them off to specific armies instead of saying everyone gets everything. I'd like that. Give the armies a bit more character. Yeah, it's, mm. it's coming. It's definitely coming. I think they'll figure this out over the next probably 12 months or so. They'll look at what stupid combos are coming out. I know the, the rule committee have done an exceptional job of trying to gauge all of these values, but I still think that across the world we'll... Uh, try and break yeah there's it. nothing like the um the testing of thousands of people playing the games and uh, trying to break it that's it <laughs> um all right so let's move on to the scenario so from the standard six in the rule book it has changed to 12 some are basically the same as what we're used to with a couple of small changes uh, i think the main one being unit strength so for things like dominate or invade where you calculate the points of a unit and that's what you use to score It's now unit strength. So as an example, individuals and war engines aren't worth anything. They don't give you any scoring at all. Troops, heroes without the individual rule, monsters, and any unit with height zero have a unit strength of one. So they're not great. Regiments are two and hordes and legions are worth three. So it's easier to calculate points. So you don't have to try and math it out to see who's going to win. Mm. Just pick uh, the size of the units or what they are and it's easy one, two, or three which is pretty cool, I think. Yep. They've also made mentions of what to do for smaller and larger boards and how to choose scenarios, but we won't go, won't go into that. You could read it for yourself. All right, so we've got Pillage, Loot, Push, Dominate, Invade, and Control, which are the ones that we should be used to. Now we've got the seventh one is Ransack. So you place the objective marker as per Pillage, but before placing each objective, the player has to roll a D3 and leave a result next to the objective, and that's how many victory points they're worth. So you'd have a whole bunch of different objectives worth different amounts fairly simple Mm -hmm. it could be fairly skewed so if you're just really unlucky and roll really low on your side and really high on your opponents could be in for uh, a hard game there Uh, is it 
done before deployment? Yeah, it's still before. Yeah, yeah, so that's all right. But I think what Benson's saying that is if I'm playing you, Spoonie, and I roll on my first three tokens, three, or six, six, so now I've got six over my side, I can really push it really close to me, where if you roll one, one, you've only got a little bit of element of control of where you put your one point. Mm. If you roll, if you manage to get the shit side, yep. that's... Yeah, it's before <laughs> rolling off the shit bad. sides. Yeah. Still, right. it could yeah. potentially, depending on your units. Yeah. Anyway, that's Ransack. Next, Secure. Uh, so in this scenario, terrain can be held in the same way as objective markers. So victory points are awarded at the end of the game. So one victory point for each obstacle that you hold, two for each hill difficult terrain or impassable piece that you hold. Any pieces of terrain that are entirely on your opponent's half of the board are worth double their normal victory point, so incentivizes you to move your army across the side to your opponent. This is the one I played um, last Thursday. It wasn't bad. Was there enough terrain? Yeah, there was plenty of terrain, but it all was on in clumps. So we'd put the um, terrain down before we rolled for scenario, and that's just what it happened to be. So you had units picking up multiple um, objectives. Right, okay. Not that it mattered anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how about you tell us about Scour? Place objective markers as per pillage. Starting from their third turn, the players may choose one objective marker that they hold at the start of their turn before any movement takes place. That objective marker is removed from play. There must be at least three objective markers on the board at all times. If there are only three on the board, then the players may not remove any more. Objective markers removed from play do not grant any victory points at the end of the game. Victory points are awarded at the end of the game as follows. One victory point for each objective marker you hold. Okay, so how, that's, there's a lot of words there. So starting at the from their third turn, players can choose one marker that they hold at the start of the turn before you move, and then you remove it. So you can choose to remove it if you want. Yes. Why would you want to? Maybe if your unit's going to get destroyed. Yeah, I think it's in those scenarios where you rapidly run up there, but you know you're going to get smashed and you just get rid of it. And then get smashed. Yep. Um, but at, at least at that point, you've you haven't lost a token or an objective. Okay. Mm. It's a it's a weird one. This one. And then, but there's there has to be at least three on the board all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Pillage is D three plus four as a starter. So it could be up to seven markers, and you have to have a minimum of three. Interesting. I'd be interested to try that one out. All right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Next. Occupy. Uh, after choosing sides, place one objective marker in the center of the board. Then the players. Each place an objective marker completely within six inches of the center line, starting with the player who chose sides. These three objective markers are the secondary objectives. Next, the players place another objective marker on their opponent's half of the board at least six inches from any board edge and nine inches from the center line. These are the primary objectives. Victory points. Victory points are awarded at the end of the game as follows. One victory point for each secondary objective you hold, Two victory points if you hold the primary objective of your uh, on your opponent's half of the board. The primary objective on your half of the board is not worth anything to you. So there's one in the center. Yep. And then each player places one within six of the center line. Center line. Yep. And then you place another one. So you'd be placing two markers each. Yeah. So one near the center line, and then one in your opponent's half. Yeah. Okay. Mm, just another weird one. At least you've got to move. <laughs> so the one in the center and the one... So the ones near the center are the secondary objectives. Yes. Okay, and they're only worth one. So you basically yep. just want to get your opponent's objective marker and maybe just sit in the middle sometimes to get the other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. There we go. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> we we <got> did. There. <laughs> These ones are always a little bit more confusing, aren't they? It's a bit wordy, isn't it? Mm. All right. It seems like something that we've kind of played before, just getting to certain areas of the board and holding it. This is just a different way of getting about there. All right, the penultimate one here, Scavenge. Uh, so this one here, we're placing a objective marker in the dead in the middle of the board. Then each of the players get to place one more on the center of the board. And from there, these are only objective markers, so they don't actually mean too much. So when you get to the objective markers, you can choose to gather loot from those markers and then you suffer from all the loot rules. That means that uh, you, you get slowed. The only difference there is you can only pick up one. Uh, so usually you'd be able to gather a whole heap of loot and then from there you will now get one of the victory points for each loot token that you hold at the end. And if you destroy a unit that's, uh, or route a unit that's got a loot token, you can elect to either pick it up or just remove it from the table altogether. Okay. 
This one sounds really cool. I like the idea of all these units getting to these uh, one of three points and then kind of scavenging yeah. some material and then slowing themselves down. So that's the thing. Like You can try and scavenge as much as you want, get as many tokens and kind of hold there. But then you're, what, speed five and can't fly? Yep. Yeah. Which is a bit of a detriment. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting one because you've still got to spend the turn to get it. So, so you can't just do the mad dash at the end. Yeah, where this is where this particular one, I think wind blast comes into it. So if you just push mm. somebody off it slightly, uh, now all of a sudden they have to use their turn to get back on it, and it's too late because it's not at the start of the turn. Yeah. So so they run up and set up, and then you just push them back, and yeah, then exactly. they're trying to run up again. And, you and push so them back. previously, <laughs> what you do is you could wind blast people out of like the six inch bubble or whatever it was, uh, the twelve inch bubble. But then they would, if you mm. they had the last turn, they could always move straight back in. It won't be the case for this yeah. because it's at the start of the turn. I think that puts a little bit of shenanigans, and I love shenanigans. Yeah, sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up, last one. Oh, do you want to read this one out? Oh, you can do oh, it. Go for great. it. Great. Um, so each player has <laughs> uh, three bounty tokens that they must place uh, in their most expensive non-individual units. Uh, if there are multiple potential units with the same cost, then the opposition player decides which of these units they are to be placed on before any units are set up. For example, Dave's most expensive unit costs 300 points, 250 points, and two units at 200 points. The 300 and 250 point units get a bounty token. I should read books. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're patronizing. <laughs> this is what my staff feel like. Don't put scissors in your eyes. <laughs> just, yeah, we know. We get it. <laughs> um, so additionally... Uh, place an objective marker in the exact center of the board so the victory points here is uh, one victory point if you hold the center objective marker and one victory point for each of your units that are carrying a bounty that have not been routed and two victory points for each bounty that you have completed okay so kill the opponents that hold the things to get more points um, sit in the middle at the end to get one point and just make sure your guys don't die that's it cool cool and that is the book it is they do a hobby scoring sheet at the back but uh, i think that falls into the bucket it's pretty much tick and flick but that is all 48 pages did anyone have any closing comments or thoughts about the books or perhaps how the book will affect things for the year no not for me i think it i'm interested to see where the next 12 months go with uh, kings of war to be honest with the meta mm, agreed all right shall we leave it there yeah Sounds good. Okay. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Hopefully you've gotten something out of this, and we'll see you next time. See ya. Bye. Yeah. Direct misfire blowing up the game. Talking many war games is our aim. From rule books to advice, we cover it all With the best tactics, we never fall Ben summon spoon all your host every vid Misfiring, but aiming up ahead Comment, like, and subscribe today Keeping you notified and up to date Come check us out at facebook.com slash directmisfire Or shoot us over an email at directmisfire at gmail.com